Hello everybody and welcome back to the Dragon's Library. So today we are going to be reviewing a new book, specifically Buy a Silver Thread, DFC Changeling Book 1, the latest release by Rachel Aaron. And some of you might be confused because I just reviewed a Rachel Aaron book that came out earlier this year. And yeah, she has two books coming out this year in the first half of the year, which was really surprising. In fact, I didn't even know Bias Silver Thread was going to be coming out until somebody commented on that review saying, hey, yeah, it just came out. So I had to immediately grab it and review it, and now we're here. So, uh, yeah, let's get right into it. First up, for those of you who don't know, Rachel Aaron is one of my favorite authors. Quite frankly, I find her work very interesting, and I particularly like her DFZ books. Those series started with Nice Dragons Finished Last, which was the first book in the Heartstriker series. That was a five book series of an urban fantasy, sort of a mix of urban fantasy and cyberpunk to be exact. She then followed that up with a spin-off DFZ series set in the same world a few years later with Minimum Wage Magic, Part-Time Gods, and finally Night Shift Dragons. Now, By a Silver Thread is returning to that world after two books in her Crystal Calamity series, which was sort of a historical fantasy instead of urban fantasy or sci-fi fantasy. So, for those of you who don't know, the DFZ series is set in a particular alternate future, where magic comes back in 2030, and by 2090, the series essentially starts. Or, not this series, but the Heart Striker series, followed up by Minimum Wage Magic, followed up by this. They're all sort of in sequen sequential order, so the previous two series have happened, but you don't actually need to have read them in order to fully understand this book. You just will understand some of the background details and you'll be able to piece together a plot a lot quicker if you know how the world already works. In this world, a spirit called Algonquin rose in with magic and destroyed the city of Detroit. She then rebuilt it before it was taken over by a new god who was the embodiment of the city and it was the Detroit Free Zone. Basically, the premise is that everything aside from murder, blood magic, outright theft, and a few other things are legal there. There are basically no corporate revelations, and it's essentially a cyberpunk dystopia. But at the same time, it's also a city of progress and free expression in a lot of ways. So while it's a crime in hellhole, where the poor literally live underneath the skyways as the rich live in giant skyscrapers, it's also a city that a lot of magic and cool stuff happens in, and it tends to be a very interesting setting for her books. So with the context out of the way, let's get into what this book is about. In the world's most magical metropolis where spirits run noodle shops and cash trap dragons stage photo ops for tourists, people still think of fairies as nothing but stories. And that's how the fairies like it. It's easier to feed on humanity's dreams when no one thinks you exist. But while this works splendidly for most fair folk, Lola isn't lucky like that. She is a changeling, a monster made just human enough to dupe unsuspecting parents while they steal their child, and the magic that sustains her was never meant to last. This leaves Lola without a future. However, thanks to Victor Conrath, a very powerful and very illegal blood mage, she was given the means to cheat death. Now, as the only changeling to ever make it to adulthood, Lola has served the Blood Mage faithfully, if reluctantly, for 20 years. Her unique ability to slip through wards and change her shape to look like anyone has helped make Victor a legend in the DFC's illegal magical underground. It's not great, but she's alive. Until her master vanishes out of trace. With only a handful of the pills that keep her human, Lola must find Victor before she turns back into the fairy monster she was always meant to be. However, with the whole team of SWAT and federal paladins hunting her as a blood mage accomplice, an urban legend on a silent black motorcycle who won't leave her alone, and a mysterious fairy king with the power to make the entire city dream the same dream, Lola's chances of getting out of this alive are as slender as a silver thread around her wrist. So for those of you who have seen Rachel Aaron's other works, particularly her previous two series in the DFC series, this is a pretty familiar plot. You got a plucky underdog who's trapped in circumstances, some major event happens that causes a mystery that they must unravel, with mysterious forces plotting larger schemes while they're caught up in the middle just trying to survive. You saw this in the Minimum Wage Magic with the fixer slash dragon daughter Opal Younge, who had to deal with a scheming god of the arena fighting the DFZ and her own father's schemes. 
you had this in the original Heartstringer series with Julius, the nice dragon, getting caught up in his brother and Estella and the Black Reaches seer schemes, all while Gonquin plotted her stuff. And Bias Silver Thread does play to Rachel Aaron's strengths. So let's get into that. What are her strengths? Well, first off, Rachel Aaron is very good about setting up characters that have good chemistry together, interesting banter, conversations, and play off each other well. She also is pretty good at making complex plots that, well, sometimes the details can get a little confused. Uh, there are various canonicity problems with the original Heart Trigger series if you want to poke holes in it. There are like a few, you know, plot holes in the way she set that up. Don't even get me started on E-Clutch. But as a whole, her stories tend to be very well plotted and well paced. I very much enjoy the way she builds her mysteries. In addition, like I said before, her characters are very intriguing. I like Lola. She's one of my favorite protagonists in her series. I think I still like Julius and Opal more. In fact, I really like Opal. Opal is probably my favorite of all her protagonists. Lola is about tied with Julius. I think Marcy from Nice Dragons is probably my second favorite. So Lola is still up there. She's still up there as characters go. I really enjoyed her struggle. She actually comes across as very underpowered, which I like in her protagonist. Opal was pretty underpowered until she became overpowered in the late thing. And Julius definitely became, was underpowered. Lola gets power up too midway through or near the end, I guess. But I'm not going to spoil that because that's plot spoilers near the end. I also liked the Blood Mage's Apprentice, Simon. He was essentially like Lola. His parents, he nearly died in an accident, so his parents went to the Blood Mage desperate for help. The Blood Mage saved him, but then he forced Simon to become his apprentice for 10 years as part of the price. And the thing with blood magic, which I should probably just explain now, is that in the DFZ's world, blood magic is a manipulation of magic and the soul by parasitic means. So when you use blood magic, you gain the ability to use to manipulate people's souls, blood, and other types of magic, but you become incapable, or at least your ability to wield magic in other ways becomes diminished. So, basically, a blood mage who uses blood magic just once will have their magic permanently marred. And the more you use it, the harder it becomes to use things like thaumaturgy or labyrinth magic. And eventually you can only use blood magic, which tends to be very parasitic. You kind of leech off the magic of others, and you damage your own ability to take and manipulate ma the natural magic of the world. Which means that a blood mage kind of goes down the rabbit hole where they use blood magic once and they start using it more and more and more and eventually they become sort of like a almost magic vampire kind of person. Victor is very much like that, leeching off victims for power and granting them small boons while slowly destroying their lives. Simon uh, essentially got marked the first time he became an apprentice and now he's essentially committed a federal and basically moral crime in the eyes of the entire world. He can almost never live anywhere but the DFZ because the DFZ doesn't, even though the blood magic is illegal there, the DFZ doesn't like outside interference, so they very rarely allow the paladins to come in, and she doesn't like them coming in her city. So blood mages are pseudo safe to practice there, as long as they don't get killed by someone else in the city. And so Simon actually has used his magic as healing. He doesn't try and leech off other people, he uses it as responsibly as possible, and when he ha doesn't have to work for Victor, because Victor basically owns him, like he does most of the other people who work for him, uh, he tries to give back and to do what little good he can with this power, despite hating it. Which I really liked. I thought it was a very interesting idea. It's like, he didn't want to be a blood mage. He doesn't like blood magic, but he tries to use it as responsibly and as kindly as possible, and use it for what little good it's capable of. Which is very interesting. You also have the fairy Vincent. He was a knight of the previous fairy queen. There's been some, you know, coup stuff going on, fairy politics, which is all very interesting. Fair folk in general, I'll get to that in a moment, and the inspiration it draws from mythology. But Vincent is a very fun character. He's very over the top. He reminds me a lot of Amelia, the planeswalker from the original Heart Striker series and the cavalier way he talks and how he's kind of like the serious badass when he needs to be, but also kind of the jokey one. All in all, it is a good set of characters. I look forward to seeing what they do in the future. I also would be remiss if I would, did not talk about the Black Rider, who is complicated, and I can't really talk about much of his character without doing spoilers for things that only happen like the li last half of the book. I will say he is kind of... Oh, God, it's how to best put it. All right, I'm going to do a minor spoiler here. He's kind of the pseudo-mortal caught up in things he really didn't want to get involved in 
it's really interesting what they did with him. I like that he doesn't want to work for Victor like anyone else here, but his method of how he got trapped in this is even more tragic than Lola's in a lot of ways. And he basically made like zero choices. He just got a shit hand dealt to him. I think Rachel Aaron almost outdid herself when it comes to tragic backstories there. Like that one is a doozy. <laughs> So, all in all, like I said, characters are good. Nice, solid cast. Now, moving on from there, we have the Fair Folk stuff. So, in the DFC, we had had, we had had, like, mentions of vampires, we had had dragons, we had had spirits and wizards and gods, and now we're getting the fairies. And the whole thing with fairies, what I really liked, so when you do something like add a secret fantasy race to your already existing fantasy world, you have to make them different. And we already know that magic is heavily influenced by belief, and that there are beings that can come from other planes that have different magic systems. Now, in the DFC world, humans can move magic, and when they move a little bit of magic as a collective species, so every human, even non-mages, can move slight amounts of magic. And when humans think a lot about ideas, they pool into God. So people think of the DFZ as this city where anything can happen, and that's why she's the living city. She's a god born of humanity's belief. Fairies are like dragons and they come from another plane, but their magic, Gossamer, which is actually a completely different magic substance similar to the dragon's fire, is basically sustained by people believing that it can exist. So when somebody looks at something made of Gossamer, like a changeling or a fairy, and they don't believe that it's real, it causes it to destabilize and to lose power. And if enough people were looking at them and disbelief, he could literally blink them out of existence. Now, the way this is described is actually really interesting because back before the drought, the magical drought where magic vanished for like a thousand years, there were really not that many people who could look at a fairy doing magic and understand that it didn't, it shouldn't have worked essentially because the only people who were educated enough were the handful of nobles, priests, scholars, and maybe a few mages who actually understood what they were doing, which was like 1% of the population. Fairies could essentially use their powers willy-nilly without any cause or concern, and people would just believe, yeah, that's the way the world works. But now, after the return of magic, they have found that they have to remain secret because most of the world is educated on the basic laws of physics. We literally have physics as a class in high school. You can't even go up to a high schooler most of the time and use fairy magic, even a world with mages and dragons, without them thinking, that's not how that works, because they all know how things work. Which is really interesting. The fairies have essentially lost a lot of power. In order to have people who believe that fairy magic can work, they essentially have to kidnap children and they're the only ones who could really believe it. And they feed off dreams, which is just so cool. I love it. I, I think it's a very interesting way to differentiate themselves. Gossamers, these trolls and goblins and fairies, they all feel very different from the other magical creatures, but they feel similar enough that you're like, I think this is like magic on a different plane that just evolved differently almost. And it has that very interesting feel of all the magic feels like it sort of works alike, but it's very clear that the fairies, like the dragons, came from another reality. And I just think that's really cool. They're almost operating on a separate system. In addition, if you don't know anything about fairies and fair folk and changelings, uh, fairies come in a variety of forms in folklore. They have very different interpretations. However, changelings are actually pretty specific. Basically, fairies would kidnap children and leave behind false replicas. Sometimes it would be old fairies who wanted to grow up, to want to, you know, be left in comfort for their final years, so they leave them for the humans to care for before they died, and various other things. And there's sort of a negative connotation to it, they don't use in this, thankfully, where fairies were often, uh, the changeling idea was often used to, in the past, in real world life, essentially, not in those books, but in the real world was often used as a way to identify people with physical disabilities or mental problems or genetic defects, essentially, where they were changelings, they were wrong or off. Um, in the book series, changelings were left behind so fairies can steal children to use them as a dream food source. 
And what happens with Lola is that she has a thread connecting her to the child. So long as she's still stable, there's sort of a link. Once she dies, the child is the fairies forever. However, Lola is slowly deteriorating when the book opens. Uh, she is in this hospital because basically Gossamer is slowly failing her. So she stopped looking like a human. She's looking more and more beast-like. But everyone else just thinks, you know, they can't quite believe that this child is changing into a monster. So they're slowly trying to understand she's changing into a monster. But once they understand that, she's going to melt away into nothingness. Because she can't sustain herself. However, at the moment, they think she's just suffering some horrible, debilitating illness. And the Blood Mage comes up to her and is like, hey, serve me and I will keep you stable and you can save your sister. And that's what she believes. She believes that the girl she was replaced with is sort of like her sister. They're bound together with this thread. And I actually really like the way they handle it. I can't wait to see what they do with her and the sister in the later book. Because this is book one of two, it looks like. And I'm really interested to see what book two is going to bring. Moving on from the Changeling Fair Folk stuff, there is something I have a problem with. I've been singing this book's praises because I like how it's introducing a new concept, it's building on the world, uh, we're getting to see more of the world I love, and Rachel Aaron clearly has more to do with this place. I really hope this becomes like a regular setting for her books because the DFC is just so open with opportunity, narratively and just artistically. But I do have one problem, and it's a problem kind of specific to me. So Rachel Aaron's world operates by certain rules. And if you understand those rules, you will see this plot coming way sooner than most of the characters. But basically there's a quirk of the magic system that the Blood Mage was exploiting that allowed me to figure out the plot twist by like a third of the way through the book. And all the other characters are like, why is this movie so popular? Like, why is he like just like trying to get everyone to see this movie? this movie about this big wolf that destroys the city called Fenrir. And I'm like, oh my God, do you not understand how magic works in this world? It's like, oh wait, they don't. God damn it, I already know the plot. <laughs> like, it didn't diminish the book for me. I understood objectively that not all these characters could piece together the world because they don't all understand and they haven't seen characters exploit this magic system in the previous books. But as someone who's literally saw stuff like this happen in the previous series, Minimum Wage Magic, I did basically feel, figure out the villain's plot by the time the first clue was introduced. Which was a bit of a bummer. I felt a little cheated because I didn't know what Bob's plan or Estella's plan was in the first book when I was reading it. And I couldn't even really figure out the Game Master's game until like the third book. I didn't understand what he was doing at first. But in this book, I've basically got the Blood Mage's number. And it kind of diminishes the mystery. Now, this is very much a me problem because I haven't just listened to these books and read these books. I have read all the Heartstriker and Minimum Wage Magic books, like physically read them. And I've also been listening to them all on repeat for the last few years because they're some of my regular listens. I like to listen to audiobooks sometimes when I'm just chilling and Rachel Aaron's DFZ collection is kind of my default go-to for a good listen. They're short enough that I can listen to them in one day usually, and they are also just very entertaining, and I like the voice acting, specifically that by Vikas Adams. I did really like this book, but I did have that one problem. Now, if you haven't actually read any of her other books, you won't have that problem. Now, if you do this and then read her other books, you might be able to predict some of the plot changes there, but that's not the point here. Still, I did want to mention that because if you read all her other books, you will probably see the plot twist coming long before it gets there. So, um, uh, yeah. In conclusion, Rachel Aaron is continuing to do great work in the DFC series. This is a fun, entertaining ride. If you want some fair folk and fairy mystery stuff, you want some reality warping magic, if you want some cool urban fantasy or cyberpunk themes, if you just like the DFZ series, dragons, gods, monsters, you will enjoy By a Silver Thread. It is Rachel Aaron at her A-game, and I very much recommend it. I recommend her entire DFZ collection. There are now nine books, soon to be ten, in this series. Give it a try. Seriously, I will have an iCard linking to her other books sometime in this video, so go check those out. 
I'm gonna give this a 9 out of 10. It was a little predictable, but still most of her strings were on full blast. What can I say? I really am just a sucker for a good Rachel Aaron book. So with all that said and done, let's go on to the announcements. Uh, I don't really have that much to say for the announcements. I am going to be watching Scream sometime this weekend. I'm currently doing a playthrough of Bre uh, Tears of the Kingdom. I decided I'm going to be streaming Tears of the Kingdom on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 7 or 7.30, depending on when I'm available. In addition, I will be playing through Star Jedi Survivor, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, and I should have a review for that sometime. Maybe before or after. I'm not sure what order I'm going to do the reviews for Tears of the Kingdom Jedi Survivor. We'll just have to see how that plays out. I'm also going to be doing a review of Scream once I get a hold of it. And I don't really have anything else on the docket. I'm going to have to see. I'll probably get, let you guys know what's going to be coming out soon after the Scream review. So look out for that. Hello. Look at this. Check out the subscribe or click on it. Go to my channel and subscribe. And then we have the playlist for this year's videos and also a video you jerk man. So click on those. Go see it. Like it. Subscribe it. And I will see you guys next time. Bye.